program for strengthening chemistry fundamentals jointly organized by chemical research society of india trivandrum chapter and st joseph college autonomous devagiri calicut kerala let me introduce myself i am dr joman matthew assistant professor in chemistry st joseph college devagiri calicut kerala let's begin the program with a silent prayer as we know in 2019 march the novel coronavirus has escalated to global pandemic and it posed an abrupt and nearly a universal shift to distance learning technologies enabled the teachers and students to quickly adapt to the new normal online classes webinars and online meetings have become part of our lives last year we had organized national and international webinars and other online sessions on advanced topics in chemistry after one year when we looked back we felt that we never explored the possibility of using excellent teachers from reputed institutions to enrich our students with the fundamentals of various chemistry that they are learning in their undergraduate and postgraduate courses i am grateful to professor mahesh kharigaran i sir tirunelveli for giving such a thought to our pleasant surprise more than 2000 participants precisely 2300 registered from various states of india which clearly indicates of such a program the program is arranged as a national level student enrichment enrichment program which covers nine topics in nine weeks the topics include thermodynamics chemical kinetics electrochemistry stereochemistry quantum mechanics phase cyclic reactions coordination chemistry etc we will have 4 to 6 hours of classes for each topic handled by professors from indian institute of science ices and iits the program is supported by department of biotechnology star college scheme government of india in this inaugural function we have our head of the department of chemistry dr tanya francis with us in fact Dr. Tanya has been working with the coordinators right from the planning of this program. I welcome Dr. Tanya Francis to this function. Our principal, Dr. Sabuke Thomas, who always encourages to organize various programs for students and gives constant support to all the activities of the Department of Chemistry. I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Sabuke Thomas to this function. next we are blessed to have our beloved manager father dr biju joseph cmi with us who is always a great help and support to all our programs i extend a warm welcome to you father professor mahesh hariharan i sir tiruvanandapuram is actually one of the coordinators of this program and convener of crsi trivandrum chapter he is the one who took the major effort in bringing those persons to this student enrichment program welcome professor mahesh kerkar i extend a warm welcome to professor sir pune who will be teaching thermodynamics today tomorrow and friday a warm welcome to dr manoj mathews assistant professor in chemistry and coordinator of dpt star college scheme st joseph college devagiri to this function I welcome all the faculty members from St. Joseph's College, Delhi, and from other colleges, and all the students who are attending this program. Thank you. Now I invite Dr. Tanya Francis for the address. A warm good, good afternoon, to one and all. It's with immense pleasure that we organize this national level student enrichment program for strengthening the basic concepts of chemistry. it has been designed as a series of scientific discourses on the fundamentals of chemistry jointly organized as jo dr jomon mentioned by crsi and department of chemistry st joseph's college autonomous devagiri calicut kerala 
the college established in 1956 by the Congregation of Religious Fathers under CMI, Devagiri College arose to the autonomous stature in the year 2014 and has attained the NAC A double plus in its third cycle of accreditation with a 3.76 on a four point scale and an NIR of a ranking of 69 in the year 2021. About the department, the Department of Chemistry is a unique department in the college in that all the eight permanent faculty members are recognized research guides under the University of Calicut, having expertise in various key areas of chemistry like polymer chemistry, supramolecular chemistry, organic synthesis, electrochemistry, catalysis, and theoretical chemistry. The past few years saw the department growing in its research capabilities with the faculty members bringing in funds of over two crores from various funding agencies like DST, DBT, RUSA, and KSCST. The department also has under its wings around 150 UG students, 24 PG students, and 12 research scholars during each academic year. It is a proud as well as humbling feeling to be associated with the Chemical Research Society of India, CRSI, which represents more than 2,300 lifetime members who actively participate in the study, practice, teaching, and promotion of chemistry. And the society has known to have active collaborations with royal societies across the globe. I take this opportunity to acknowledge the efforts of Professor Mahesh Hariharan, Isa Trivandrum, and convener CRSI Trivandrum chapter for contacting the resource persons and the meticulous planning made along with Dr. Jomon Matthew, who is the coordinator, and Dr. Manoj Matthews, who is also the coordinator of the DBT star, both faculty members of Department of Chemistry, St. Joseph's College, Devagiri, in bringing together the knowledge giants in the field to converse with the student community. We begin the series, as uh, Sir said, with thermodynamics, a talk on thermodynamics uh, by Professor Arnab Mukherjee from ISA Pune, who will be talking to us uh, today as well as tomorrow and on Friday. The second series, would uh, we will be looking at chemical kinetics, and we'll be led in this by Dr. Jatish Kumar from ISA Tirupati. The third in the series is on electrochemistry by Professor Muhammad Mustafa Oti from ISA Pune. We have uh, an introduction to the reagents for oxidation and reduction as well as a molecular orbital approach to organic chemistry by Professor A.T. Biju from IISE Bangalore. The spectroscopical concepts will be introduced by Dr. Jino George from ISA Mohali. Professor Ajay Venugobal from Mysore Trivandrum will introduce us to coordination chemistry. Professor Reggie Vergis will take us into the visualized concept of stereochemistry from, and he's from Isa Trivandrum. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Rosita Kunil from IIT Palakkad uh, talking to us on quantum mechanics, which will be the last in the series. I take this uh, platform to place on record my sincere gratitude to the management led by Reverend Father Dr. Biju Joseph and our dear principal, Dr. Sabu K. Thomas, who have been a source of both constant encouragement and support. The overwhelming support received from the student community, both state level as well as national, is highly encouraging with over 2,500 registered participants. Even when we had uh, organized webinars in the past, the maximum participation came up to around 500 to 600, which were focused on mostly research topics. Now we actually recognize the need for addressing more fundamental uh, concepts in chemistry. I take this opportunity to congratulate all the participants for having taken some time out to join us this afternoon and praying for your continuous support. Hope it will be a wonderful learning experience to each one of you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Dr. Tanya Francis. Now I invite Dr. Sabuka Thomas.
a warm good afternoon and welcome to all the participants of the program. And most respected Father Dr. Bill Joseph, manager of the college. And the chief guest of this program today, as I see Professor Arnav Mukherjee from ISA Pune, Professor Mahesh Harharin, ISA Tuandra, and the coordinators of this very big event. Dr. Jomo and Joseph, and the DBT coordinator, Dr. Manoj Matthews, and the head of the department, Dr. Tanya Francis, and all the faculty members of the chemistry department of the Avery College Calicut. It's a very proud moment for the Devagiri College. Because what I see here and from what I heard from Dr. Tanya, all the top class workers of the country will be assembling on this forum. And the Devagiri College is blessed to have the young great professors from ISER, NICER, and then IAC all to share their expertise. I would say share their expertise, international exposure and the kind of uh, exp experience they have, that all will be, will be reaching all across the country. It is not just confined to the 50 or 60 students of uh, the very College alone. But when I see the number is an astounding 2,000. So we said the mic mute. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So the kind of interest could generate, and I understand Professor Mahesh Hariharan has been uh, doing a great lot of homework and helped all the uh, faculty members of our college and to have this program here. And uh, what I expect of this program, all the youngsters, definitely they will be learning the uh, student enrichment program with the chemical fundamentals. And also, they will be learning about the fields and the laboratory setups and the kind of uh, work people like Professor Arnab Mukherjee do in their lab. And not only that, I know that in my college, more, many students are having various kinds of national scholarships. But what I see one pattern, most of them are reluctant to go out. I don't know the reasons. But this kind of meetings, definitely, because here the professors are sparing their time to share their expertise with you, time with you. And they will be speaking about the field. And the student community, I hope that, communicate with the young talks of the uh, our great country. And they will make use of this opportunity to have, have good great internships that will lead to greater and greater higher levels, like uh, a good <clears throat> internship in the institutes, exposure with the various kinds of uh, the programs they organize. And uh, definitely they will be uh, uh, watching the websites of all these institutes. So it will give a lot of exposure in addition to the chemistry fundamentals. That's what I see from here. So once again, I congratulate the department and congratulate Dr. Biju Joseph Father for uh, <coughs> supporting the college and for the faculty members for coordinating this activity. I heard it is going to be a many, it, this program is for a long, long period and you have your own responsibilities. I know next week on the exams are all coming on and uh, somehow you could uh, manage it all and that shows your enthusiasm and your interest in the field. So definitely this is what actually uh, Devagiri is looking forward to and definitely, and I'm quite thankful to yeah, Professor Mahesh Harharan and Professor Arnav Mekhaji, like a great personalities for uh, helping this college and the student community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabuka Thomas. Our manager, Father Dr. Piju Joseph, CMI, for presentation. Am I audible? Yes, Father. 
Okay, thank you. A warm good afternoon to all. Respected Principal Dr. Sabuke Thomas. This a resource person of today, Dr. Arna Mukherjee. Coordinator of the program, Dr. Jaman Mathieu, Professor Mahesh Hariharan. DVT coordinator, Manoj Mathieu. Faculty members, my dear students. First of all, I congratulate the entire Department of Chemistry for arranging a one month long national level students enrichment program for strengthening chemistry fundamentals in students. Hope that it will be helpful for the students to have comprehensive understanding about various concepts in chemical science and in sharpening their research aptitude and pursuing the career options. It's our experience that science shapes our daily lives because it impacts countless decisions we make each day, like managing our health and well-being, even choosing paper or plastic at grocery store, or answering a child who asks why the sky is blue. Science has an important role in our lives. It is a systematic study of the structure and behavior of physical, social, and natural way through observation and experimentation. It's a key to innovation, global competitiveness, and human advancement. It's important that the world continues to advance the field of science, whether in finding new vaccines for COVID or identifying and exploring new galaxies. Beyond this potential breakthrough, there are individual benefits in learning science, like developing our ability to ask questions, collecting information, organize and test our ideas, solving problems, and to apply what we have there. It also offers a powerful platform for building confidence, developing communication skills, and managing sense of world around us. We know that the world is increasingly shaped by science and technology. Engaging students in science content requires educators to help students see themselves as scientists instead of passively observing other people doing research, research in science. It's about creating opportunities for them to see science in application instead of just reading about it in the textbook. In this content here, the Department of Chemistry is arranging an opportunity to explore different avenues in science, especially in chemical science. We have a one-month program for enabling the students, especially the undergraduate students, to strive for higher studies and career opportunities. Teachers like uh, Arna Mukherjee from reputed institutions like IISC, IITs, ISA will be available for helping you all. Here, my request to the students is that make use of this opportunity. It's a chance for you to look forward, to see things brighter, work hard for your dreams, and to be capable of being successful in life. Once again, I appreciate the HOD coordinators and all the faculty members of chemistry department for designing such an innovative activity, even in the period of COVID pandemic. I'm sure that the program like this will be helpful for the students to be prepared to embrace science with its multidimensional potentialities and even to pursue their career options. Wishing you all success, I remain. Thank you. Thank you, Father Dr. Peter Joseph. 
actually i wanted to we wanted to hear from professor mahesh hergar but he has some he had been with us for a few minutes but since he has some he, he left the meeting i think uh, probably later on once we can get him. so with this uh, we are we are concluding our former session for the inaugural session of this uh, entire uh, student enrichment program and we are moving to the class uh, so before before that i have few instructions and suggestions to we will be continuing the thermodynamics class tomorrow and friday uh, sharp at 2:30 pm without any formal function second feel free to ask questions you can type your questions in the box we will take it at the end of today's class additionally we have shared a google form in whatsapp groups you can post your questions in google form and communicate it with professor anna mukherjee feedback form will be available only at the end of this entire session i mean uh, at the end of uh, the modern and session so that will be on friday, uh, friday evening okay so today's uh, session will be chaired by dr manoj mathews assistant professor and coordinator of dbt star college program uh, department of chemistry st joseph college delhi i invite dr manoj mathews to chair the session thank you dr jomon <laughs> respected principal dr sabu k thomas our beloved manager reverend father dr biju joseph cmi professor mahesh kariyaran i said to vandram who has been a coordinator of this program dr jomon and all, and especially today's resource person professor arnab mukherjee and dear faculty members and students so here we are conducting this program with the support of dbt department of biotechnology under their star college program dbt supports under for colleges especially for the undergraduate programs with this funding we for strengthening the infrastructure facility of the college so we received about 1.5 one 1 crore 5 lakhs towards this funding and as part of that this is one of the program where students enrichment program is conducted so with that we have also strengthened the infrastructural facilities of the college especially laboratories now this is also a part of that program which is funded by the uh, dbt as you know the undergraduate students and postgraduate students the final destination of course their dream destination is iacs iits and uh, uh, icers so therefore we decided to bring in the faculty members from such reputed institutes and also they are very good teachers so students should take this opportunity because they are also the interviewers for their msc programs phd programs so they will definitely be focusing on the area where they want their students to be expertized so that is the reason why we brought in these very excellent teachers from these for these programs so today i am lucky to introduce our uh, resource person that is professor arnab mugarchi from ice pune he may not need an introduction because he is a very eminent teacher and you can see his lectures on the nptel nptel he is a resource person there many of you would have attended his uh, uh, classes especially in uh, chemistry and biochemistry where he is taking a course on chemi chemical principles so he is a very passionate teacher but just to tell you before that professor mukherjee obtained his phd from iisc bangalore then he had several uh, post doctoral research experiences from france and uh, us then he became a faculty member icer pune since 2009 his research area is computational biophysics so you can understand the interdisciplinary nature of that topic computational biophysics he deals with drug dna interaction proteins holding structure dynamics of dna please go to his website for all his detailed work and the recent publications so what i want to tell you is you are lucky to have his uh, he is a very passionate teacher as i said that all the lectures are available for you at the uh, nptel class but now we will have something new you can directly hear from the resource person so the stage is yours sir please uh, have next two hours probably is uh, we are looking forward to your wonderful class and students please make use of it you can write your questions in the chat box he will be with us for uh, 
two more sessions you can use that opportunity make it an interactive one thank you and welcome sir thank you thank you very much so am i am i audible now like is it okay yes sir thank you yeah so uh, you know first of all uh, it's, a, it's really a privilege uh, to be you know speaking to uh, such a large audience uh, such a large number of students uh, the largest number that i ever taught in iser was around 230 so uh, that is the first year batch in iser pune and again i am lucky that um, i had the opportunity to teach uh, first year students both in the first semester and in the second semester for consecutive five years and i think with that uh, you know uh, opportunity i knew basically uh, how to teach because uh, before that i was teaching a senior student in the sixth standard and uh, things were you know not you know you can present the topic in a very different way to a senior student uh, but all the enthusiastic bright students when they come to iser pune their enthusiasm actually kind of uh, almost engulfs you when you are in the dais so so that's why uh, this is very different because i cannot see the students eyes i cannot see those sparkles uh, enthusiasm eagerness and all that those uh, will be missing but i hope i will try to imagine that those will be there somewhere in the background and uh, you know in fact uh, when i go into the st stage or stage meaning you know the teaching stage i kind of forget uh, myself when i look at the students uh, again it's very different from a small class and large class so 2000 i cannot even imagine it will be i have to be a rock star to basically teach such a big audience with you know big mics and all that probably so uh, uh this experience to teach you know again thanks to uh, mahesh oriyan whom i know for a, for a long time i think we joined almost at the same time to different ises so uh, i had this opportunity to uh, conduct this faculty development program again to uh, call you know teachers of uh, kerala uh there were like 100 participants and i think i this seven days i discussed on uh, statistical thermodynamics and uh, in between lecture is something that i will uh, show uh, where uh, 30 hours of content uh, on thermodynamics is given for the students so it is much more elaborate slow and there are tutorials available and every year that runs uh, so you know assignments and even exams will be conducted fee is very minimal i guess 1000 rupees uh, one can enroll and get certificate not only you know my course there are so many other valuable courses are there in fact i get to learn a lot from different npdel courses so please make use of uh, those resources again both for teachers and for the students please make use of those resources because they are so beneficial uh, so much helpful nowadays in fact we know that things are going towards more and more online mode and now we have an academy for young kids uh, you know i was looking at uh, class 7 course for my son and uh, i saw that there are good contents there and before that there was khan academy which is still there and free however is kind of vast one has to find out the particular topic but uh, in an academy it will be kind of organized way similarly in nptel it will be very organized way module based courses one can look at particular module and only look at that particular part if there is a confusion in fact when i teach nowadays uh, to uh, my you know uh, now i'm not teaching first years anymore like third year i teach advanced thermodynamics or uh, you know it's called uh, chemical equilibria so there uh, sometimes i refer to again my empirical lecture the part of it and things like that so uh, so yes so i i again you know i do not claim uh, to be uh, you know a great teacher i first of all i kind of uh, i am kind of being humbled by you know, in front of so many teachers here and i know they are much much more experienced than me just because i am in iser pune but what i have you know being in an iser pune or being in so called elite institutions the advantage that i have is time because we have less course to teach and therefore we can spend more time 
on each you know particular course so for example when i started teaching thermodynamics i myself have looked into uh, courses from mit from harvard from yale you know uh, from uh, in ptel from every resource that i could find books that i could find but that much time i could give only because probably i was teaching one or two courses so that is advantage and again great colleagues uh, with whom i can discuss uh, i can you know share ideas and that again uh, has uh, you know really good advantage i have my so everybody has mentor so i have my teacher mentor like you know colleague who is a mentor uh, in my teaching so all those things actually help so my purpose here in three uh, you know three days of lecture uh, i don't know whether i will be able to i i, I thought that i will do only one and a half hour i was not sure but we will see how long we'll go so my objective is not to teach somebody that is that is not possible in 3 hours okay then i can actually do in 3 minutes first law second law third law zeroth law <laughs> okay but the objective my objective is to introduce you to this new uh, you know to this particular topic that that this is not something you know full of equations and things like that this is uh, this can be understood in a very very different way so uh, that is the objective here uh, and it is uh, in a very you know basic level as you can see because it is uh, it's a course so it is designed to be uh, for the first year or, or a third year bsc level although some of the part can you know even can be beneficial for msc students who are Uh, going to be uh, you know learning statistical thermodynamics if you mean in ptel there are courses on statistical thermodynamics by eminent uh, professors like professor sagarin tarotar who taught molecular thermodynamics which is a great continuation good continuation for this course and again by many many other uh, other teachers so you know depending on your interest and choice i would request you to please look into uh, those resources okay okay it may take take some time to look into this if for example in youtube everything is probably available but you don't know which is authentic and which is not but in npdl you will know at least that it is authentic because it is taught by uh, teachers from iit zizers and all that so at least you know their identity you know their field of work and things like that so i saw some raised hand so maybe you can go ahead and ask question if you have any at this moment uh okay okay fine if there is okay any time you can stop me and ask questions okay so you know as a as a scientist or as a researcher mainly our job is to uh, you know give uh, lectures on our research topic and of course teach uh, students here but this is very different where we can go across the across the country to uh, to deliver lectures on on fundamental topics and this is a subject whether you believe it or not i was very much afraid of when i was a student i was telling probably jaman uh, that day i don't know so i, I was very uh, very much afraid of uh, thermodynamics in my bsc and uh, and thing is that when i see somebody again is afraid of the subject i kind of find myself in that person i said okay fine if i can learn then you know you can also learn right so i was afraid and i got over that by you know by by just studying by paying a little bit more attention and removing the fear from our mind from my mind that it is difficult so if you think something is difficult then that makes a barrier and a block immediately so my uh, postdoc boss who is a very very senior famous scientist highly respected all over the world his name is jt hines he told me you know phenomenal thing he told me that there are only 10 different things to learn basically to learn in the bracket there are only 10 different things what it means is that that 10 different probably new things everything else will fall in all those 10 different things so when you are encountering something new it is something related to what you already know or or you can associate that to something you already know and therefore it makes it easier to think that this is not that greatly you know different and remember everything is you know all these topics all these subjects are man made 
him you know somebody created them you know uh, somebody or 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 lot of people efforts got into that and this knowledge has been created it was not there before it, it nature always existed with all those rules we are just trying we are finding it out every day those rules and we understand them a little bit more better with time so if you think that as as something that that this subject is a tool to understand things then probably it is much easier than if you think this is a subject that i have to pass or i have to get good marks so immediately this attitude changes i can tell you why i learned this subject because when i had to teach then i was i didn't have the fear of getting less marks of course i have i had the fear of teaching badly but not the fear of getting less marks so and i wanted to understand it so that i can do a good job so therefore it helped so i think attitude makes a big difference in uh, whatever subject we learn and i know many of you as a as a kid uh, you know uh, as a as a young young student uh, like to learn new things they are mesmerized by new things so just remove the block that is there in your mind uh, to understand certain things and then you will see that you will be able to enjoy that particular topic in a much deeper and much uh, you know uh, better way so uh, okay so uh, jaman if you can create a poll uh, can you please create a poll to see the what i mentioned that how many are uh, from bsc and how many from msc and uh, how many for you know to a standard level or below bsc so i think uh, in this college everybody is uh, coming after a 12th right bsc onwards right yes yes sir. okay yes. okay so while you are doing that i will share my slide i think i have to share the entire screen because uh, the rest powerpoint will not be visible okay so i think you can see my screen right yes sir this is yes yes okay and the cursor is also probably visible okay so i will uh, yeah i will start then now while the maybe poll is going on so um again so thermodynamics thermodynamics i i mentioned here that it's a subject to study the change of matter so chemical principles too the the topic of uh, nptel lecture that i that was mentioned uh, is actually because in isa we have we designed two courses back to back in first semester it was chemical principles 1 which was basically quantum mechanics and second semester chemical principles 2 which was thermodynamics and kinetics so so the way the subjects are is that quantum mechanics kind of gives you a description of the matter it it tells you the energy of the system if you if you or or let's say molecule or or any any system you can get its energy but thermodynamics will tell you whether the system will change or not so thermodynamics deals with the change and kinetics will tell you how much time it will take to change so matter then change of matter and then rate of change of matter so these are the three things that uh, you know uh, constitute a major com uh, component of uh, chemical principles so that's how that's how it was designed but then i changed the name to basic thermodynamics because it is more common to uh, to student community so it right, right now it runs with uh, that name so i will just uh, since my screen is visible i will just quickly show my nptel uh, screen so this is the nptel lecture that i am teaching you can see i was very different back then i think it was 2018 3 years back um and uh, there are like 12 12 lecture 12 weeks uh, content are there first 6 weeks is uh, on classical thermodynamics classical aspects of thermodynamics and 7 8 9 10 uh, 11 
we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about statistical thermodynamics. And the last lecture is basically an overview and road ahead and all that. So, you know, you can start with the last lecture if you want to. If you are familiar with the classical aspects, you can start with the seventh lecture onwards, which is statistical foundation of second law. So, today I will, uh, today, uh, these three lectures, I will try to touch upon both the classical and statistical. I saw the syllabus and uh, the syllabus contained that. And again, this is uh, Iser Pune. It, it has a beautiful campus, uh, as you can see here. You can go to iserpune.ac.in. Uh, really, you know, Pune has a fantastic weather and, uh, and beautifully constructed building and greeneries and things like that. It's a very nice place to be. And this is my website uh, where you can see my research area. Uh, if you click on research, you can see what are the things I work on. And, uh, and of course, publication and other things you can always see. And teaching. In the teaching also, you can see the, the link to the NPTEL lectures. Okay. So right now, I'm teaching this physical chemistry of solutions. Okay, okay so yeah, I work on drug in intercalation and, and, uh, and then uh, uh, design new drugs, uh, basic chemistry, dynamics, structure, and all that. So, uh, you know, somebody was mentioning that, you know, uh, that to, to, to also talk to you about interview questions, you know, please remind me later. Definitely, I would like to. So, one thing is that in any interview, you, you know, you will be tested for your basic fundamental knowledge, not the bookish knowledge. So, when you answer a question, it will definitely be followed by another question. Because that question will, and those series of questions will lead you to, uh, uh, you know, a direction where you're, you're, if you are strong in, in fundamental knowledge in that subject, you will do well. But if you somehow did not understand, but just remembered some of the aspects, then uh, that will not be possible. So, so to do well in the interview, all that you need to do is that read the chapter of the book maybe four or five times. Yeah. So uh, okay. So I will I will continue then. So thermodynamics is a subject uh, to study the change of matter. And again, this is my thrust. This is my main things that I want to you know, come across, like want to, uh, you know, want for you to take home. And if you understand this, why it is a study of change of matter, why is the subject to study change of matter, then I think you will understand thermodynamics. So again, I say that it is about heat, energy and work. You know, first law of thermodynamics. So again, as I said that I will not be take, telling in a very traditional way because you will be anywhere uh, reading those, right, in the class. So I will be kind of trying to give an overview. So heat, energy and work, you know, this is, this constitutes the first law of thermodynamics, right? Because we will come to that again later on. But these are the three things, important things, and they are all different forms of energy. All, and that's why I put them in different color and all. Actually, I wanted to make them change, change its color continuously because uh, heat is getting converted to energy or energy is getting converted to work and things like that. So they continuously change you know, uh, one form to another form, but they are all different forms of energy. So, and that, yeah, okay, I have done that. You see, I've tried to change it. And then that is all veiled by, it is kind of veiled, all of them by something called entropy. How it is, it is a pictorial description, but somehow this guy, entropy, is controlling all that. And how and all, you know, if you don't know, you will come to know. So, there was a term coined by William Thompson just for the history knowledge. He synthesized the subject of, uh, of Gardner's motive power of heat, Joule's mechanical equivalent of heat, and Clausius' mechanical theory of heat into a subject called thermodynamics. So, 1854 is long time after the effort to understand thermodynamics has started. I will give you a little bit overview of that. 
but this is the full bird's eye picture. So, energy is the property of matter while entropy is how the energy is distributed. So, this is the most important slide of my whole uh, you know, presentation on three days. So, this you have to understand. So, if I have some amount of energy, like if I have some material, for example, I have a glass of water, it has some energy. Or if I have a have a, uh, an oil or a petrol or, or something, it has some form of, form of energy or a, or, a, or, a, or a paper. So it has energy. But entropy tells us that how the energy is distributed. So when I burn the paper, the energy will be distributed across our environment. So the same energy that was there in the paper I, I just put a spark that is not really, I'm not giving energy, I'm just giving a catalyst and that will burn the paper and that energy will be distributed. So earlier it was confined within the paper and now it is distributed in the environment. So how the energy is distributed is governed by or, or the distribution of energy will give us an idea about the entropy. Whereas the energy itself is the property of matter. So quantum mechanics will help you calculate energy. If you solve Schrodinger equation, you will get the energy. But how it will be distributed, the thermodynamics will tell you. For example, here, let's imagine that we have same amount of energy. Something is distributed in a very narrow shaped manner. Something distributed in a flat shaped manner. And they will have different entropy. So this is what uh, most important thing. Now it is disconnected from from all that we we have we see in our books, right? The definition of entropy. If you know already, then you will be able to connect it. Otherwise, you will see later on that entropy will be irreversible by T temperature, right? Or somebody will define in a statistical thermodynamics way as S equal to K B L and W. But all that will will lead to this. That it is the distance. Remember one thing: the energy of the universe is conserved. It is not changing with time. It is fixed. But entropy is always increasing. Yes, if you want to ask any question, please go ahead and ask. So you can interrupt me and ask. So energy of the universe is conserved, but we know that entropy is increasing every day. Why it is possible? How it is possible? Because the distribution of energy is changing every day. And it will keep on changing till we reach the equilibrium. Which will be actually, as you will see, is the death of the universe basically. Because till then, we will be continuously increasing the entropy of the universe. That is the fate of the universe. So, uh, thermodynamics is everywhere. That is true. Like, you know, you will hear somebody saying that physics is everywhere. You will hear somebody saying mathematics is everywhere. Now I'm saying, you know, so you will see, hear somebody saying organic chemistry is everywhere. You know, my son was asking me that, you know, you are saying sometimes physics is everywhere, sometimes chemistry is everywhere. And then I kind of realized that, yes, because everything is part of science and science is everywhere. So it is not different. Everything is connected. So whether you call it physics at, you know, in, in, from certain angle or mass from certain angle or chemistry from certain angle, it depends on your perspective. But, but the, 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 since uh, the world is around us are following these rules, that means those rules are everywhere. When you play a game in a, in a court, then the rules apply to that court only. But since the science is being played in the universe, then the rules will apply to every aspect in the universe. So that's why it is omnipresent. Now, to be more, a little bit more, you know, precise or elaborate, is that, that it's a subject that deals with the change of matter energy. The change of matter, for example, when you have a chemical reaction, okay, any, any kind of chemical reaction, it, it 
you think of, then what will happen? This species will change it to another mole one molecule will change to another molecule. Change of various forms of energy, for example, solar, electrical, chemical, mechanical, and we see all the time that one form of energy changes to another form of energy. You know, in, in between it can do some work also. Change of phase of the system, ice becoming water or vapor and all that, right? We heat, we heat water, it becomes vapor, we cool water, it becomes ice. Matter is not changing, the, the structure of the matter is of course changing, interaction is changing and uh, Entropy is of course changing all the time and combination of all that above. So there is only one rule that allow all those changes. So this is basically I am kind of mimicking Lord of the Rings if you have read. So in the Lord of the Rings uh, there was a famous statement or only most important one. Then there is a one ring to rule them all. So I just changed a little bit saying that there is only one rule to you know, rule them all. And that rule is, as you will see, is entropy. So thermodynamics essentially is a study of entropy. Some people call it enigmatic entropy. Yeah, I will share an article uh, which I wrote for uh, my uh, my institute's uh, uh, popular magazine journal called Helicus, where uh, I try to put that in, in, in form of a story. But I will share that probably at the end, where you will understand a little bit more. But it's a story. So this one rule, if we understand the rule of entropy, then we'll understand thermodynamics. Okay, so we have to understand that. And I know that many people are afraid about entropy, but essentially, I hope that at this end of this class or end of these three classes or whatever, you will see that it is actually a very easy thing to understand. It is not complicated at all. That is my objective. So matter change with energy con conversion. So some of the examples we all know, photosynthesis, for example. And then same thing that, you know, that uh, so carbon dioxide, you know, is used by the, by the trees, plants to make it, uh, you know, glucose. That is used by, you know, animals and using oxygen, they convert it again to chemical energy and it is stored in ATP. You know, adenosine triphosphate, you know, energetic molecule. It's called energy currency of our body because ATP breaks into ADP and phosphate or AMP and diphosphate and it releases energy. And that release of energy does some work in our body. So, in our body, the energy is stored in ATP. You know, people are trying to see why ATP, why not GTP, why not, you know, CTP and things like that. Even in our department, uh, one colleague is working on that. So you see the sunlight now, in these two steps got converted to chemical energy. So solar energy got converted to chemical energy. And we know, uh, know plenty of examples where solar energy gets converted to electrical energy, right? The solar panels are kept everywhere. So now, why I said thermodynamics is everywhere? Because if you go from atom onwards, when atoms make molecules, there is a change. Of course, it has to be governed by thermodynamics. Molecules will make supramolecules like DNA. And that will require a change because two DNA strands will have to come, form hydrogen bond, and then, you know, make helix and all that. And then cell, then organelle, uh, uh, organelle cells, uh, uh, and then tissues, organs, all that. And full organisms like, you know, human beings. So, so all these small to big, everywhere, all the reactions that are happening in our body, body or inside a you know, human body or outside, everywhere, everywhere you will find chemical reactions and changes are happening, work is being done, energy is converted to one form to another, molecules are making and breaking. So at every step of the way, things are changing and energy is getting redistributed. So you, you saw that the energy that was there in glucose got redistributed into ATP. So the, the energy came from one place and put it in another place. That's it. We take it from one place and put it in other place. 
and in that process we will have to give some penalty and that is entropy that penalty that we give we'll come to that later and you see this is many people think uh, of this as a you know happy work uh, video i try to find the source but i could not so this is a kinase in protein that is uh, being transported uh, motor protein that is being transported and then and th this transport requires a work to do and that work which is work here work is a work and that is done by the su supply of energy so you know the, without energy one cannot do anything there is nothing called free lunch i'll talk about that uh, so in order to get something you have to give something so if you need to do some work you have to spend some energy simple as simple as that that's first law of thermodynamics you cannot get things out of nothing you have to spend something so again so another very very interesting thing our vision right so when light falls into our eye we can see something right light falls into the we, we all know right that when we see something it means that the light falls on that object then reflects and come to our eye and then we can see that right but why we cannot see that in the dark in the dark we have uh, uh, i'll just do this in the dark we have uh, we don't have this visible light but we have ultraviolet uh, or sorry uh, we, we can have uh, we can see things in intra in, uh, infrared or you know there can be ultraviolet rays so all that will not help us to see that right so we need visible light the reason again is that in the visible light there is a photoisomerization reaction that is possible that frequency of the visible light enables that isomerization to take place and that will help us to see the thing so again you can see that it is not going to be possible to do that in any other frequency of light and again i have mentioned that the infrared light cannot drive this change okay different phases of the same molecule is called polymorphism ice vapor water carbon also is polymorphic same carbon uh, black carbon, you know, gives graphite and diamond. You know, such a wonderful thing, right? Something that is carbon soot is has the same element as a diamond, except the structure is different. And that, you know, nature has designed that beautifully. So we only observe them once it happens, and then try to understand why it happens. And also, it is again. You know the change that is happening not just in the in the elements of our universe, but the universe itself. We know that, or our current theory knows that uh, you know universe started with a big bang and 13.7 billion years ago, and that time it was almost like a point, and it got expanded with time, and you know it has become huge now, of course, because every instant the universe is expanding. So this is this uh, taken from this particular side. So, so it shows that uh, that with that expanse, the entropy of the universe is increasing at every every you know minute, like every second, right? Initially, the temperature was very high. You will see, you will know that uh, you will see probably if I can uh, talk about that that an adiabatic expansion will cool down the system. So this expansion, this expansion that happens initially, the temperature was very high. Now it cooled down right now to an interstellar temperature of 2.7 Kelvin, very close to zero, very close. Has already become very cold. Now the ultimate, ultimate temperature that it can go to is zero, right? Or, or very close to zero. It has not gone there yet. But when it will go, the universe will basically be not there. Will be a heat bath, cold heat bath, cold meaning as cold as almost zero Kelvin. Now, physical aspects of thermodynamics. So, so engineers. So, thermodynamics is used by chemical engineers also, and you know physics also use that. And you know, uh, in, 
every every subject there is surveillance for example initially it was it came you know you know the necessity of thermodynamics or, or the, the subject you know came about to find better machines more efficient machines okay more efficient engines so engine is something again that will convert the heat to work so for example here we are talking about external combustion engines like uh, this kind of a uh, uh, train which uh, you know uh, which uses the coal and then you know with the steam steam engine we call it right external combustion engine and there is something called internal combustion engine which we have in car uh, and uh, yeah in our cars we have that internal combustion engine both uh, we have like diesel car and uh, we have petrol car they have you know two you know different types of combustion engines you, you know uh, the cycle you will you, i'll talk about the cycle also if i get it so so engine will convert heat to work and refrigerator will actually do work to cool down the system so you will need electrical energy that will do the work such that the inside of the refrigerator becomes cooler okay so it's just the opposite process but both will require a supply of energy and both will use Uh, or we will have to let go some of the thing as entropy some of the energy uh, they will have to spend as entropy or in terms of entropy not energy and entropy are not same right energy is we will we'll come to know is equal to t time uh, temperature multiplied by entropy so efficiency of the engine is dictated by the laws of thermodynamics in thermodynamics will tell you that one cannot get a fully efficient like an engine with efficiency 1 that means whatever energy you are giving same amount of work is never going to be possible that is forbidden by thermodynamics because if that would be possible then so many laws will be violated meaning second law not so many but different aspects of the second law will be violated so um, that also probably i will touch upon that uh, why is that that the case why we cannot get an engine with efficiency 1 because if we get that which means that there will be no entropy production we will convert fully the energy into work and if that is possible no entropy production that is not allowed as you will see so books i will just try to mention for example so today uh, you know if you ask me about question that that we can ask in the interview so i talked about something today right we can take any of those topics and ask you that why is that you know why we cannot see uh, things in in the dark or you know why there is uh, what is this internal and external combustion engines how they are different we can make questions from this itself uh, you know what does polymorphism means if the polymorphism happens then why at all it happens all those kind of questions one can ask so the thing is that as i said that uh, in interview the way it goes is that once you answer a question that creates more question and that's how it progresses uh, maybe we will discuss more specific uh, questions from you later on so uh, books i will first try to mention so uh, silvi alberti bavindi this book is very good for thermodynamics especially first law second law uh, first law part is very nicely explained atkins is anyway a great book extremely popular very conceptual and you can really uh, learn a lot of things from uh, by just reading the book but one has to read multiple times because the book is so concise that one reading is not sufficient okay so if you do it two three times you will get a lot of things so this is a new book robert hens uh, hansen and susan green introduction to molecular thermodynamics beautifully written book beautifully so uh, it will give you the molecular uh, thermodynamics view of uh, thermodynamics and uh, and I, i i sometimes use some of the games which i won't be able to play here but i can mention and you guys can play the games uh, those are the games uh, to understand you know boltzmann distribution but just by playing rock paper and rock paper and scissor game you will understand by playing rock paper and scissor game you will understand boltzmann distribution and that is written by this uh, this authors it's a chemical education paper. Ken Dill, another little advanced book uh, of molecular driving forces uh, that is mostly uh, 
taking each topic uh, of, uh, of, uh, of physical chemistry and looking into the statistical aspect of it. Callen, Herbert Callen, fantastic book. You know, uh, I knew about that when I was a BSc student, but never read it. And uh, I should have read it because it is so beautiful. It's a little mathematical, but, uh, but it is clear. You know, one can read a half part of it, right? Not the statistical part. The first part, you can just go through it very, very quickly or like a storybook. Now, I will talk about, you know, a little bit of history. You can see there are wave archives. You can go there and you can find a lot more information. So, as you can see that thermodynamics has a very long history, unlike uh, quantum mechanics. Because thermodynamics is something that is going on for a long time. Some, uh, you know, like permanites, uh, that is like before Christ. But even if I take uh, like Galileo and Torricelli and all that, they all wanted to make vacuums. So, you know, they thought that vacuum is kind of a, a, a source of energy. If you create vacuum, you can, you know, do some, do a lot of uh, work, right? So that was, uh, that was the time it started. And then, you know, Grady, Boyle, uh, Huygen, and then uh, Dennis Papa, they all, they have all contributed. Bernoulli, for example, gave the first uh, idea of uh, statistical thermodynamics in terms of calculating pressure. But again, nobody understood probably that because it took a uh, long time uh, till Maxwell came to understand what he has done. Uh, and, uh, and again, as you can see, Jules Clausius, they are the guys who introduced second law of thermodynamics. So second law is the one that came first, okay, around this 18, 1850s. Second law came first, then came first law. Third law, I don't know when it came, maybe sometime. And zeroth law came the last. Because it came last and, you know, see, if it came first, it would be first law, right? But why it was not put as fourth law? You will understand that without zeroth law, none of the other laws will exist. So therefore, it had to be the first of them. And since first law was already there, that's why it was called zero law. And you can see uh, Boltzmann, Ludwig Boltzmann, the sole guy who actually uh, introduced the statistical concept of thermodynamics, which was, by the way, used by Max, uh, by uh, uh, Planck later on uh, to uh, introduce the, the Planck's constant, which gave birth to quantum mechanics. So, in a way, thermodynamics led to statistical thermodynamics, led to quantum mechanics. And uh, interestingly, uh, this uh, program is starting with thermodynamics and ending with quantum mechanics. So, that is also a very nice coincidence. Now, before people understood thermodynamics, why we need to understand science? Because so that we don't make mistakes. You know, there are, there are programs in the TV channels called The Science of Stupid. I don't know if you have seen that. You know, it's uh, interesting. So, it's like this. So, a lot of people wanted to make perpetual motion machine. Machine that will run forever. See, look at this ratchet. This ratchet is designed in such a way that it can only go in one direction. If you see, if it tries to go the other direction, this thing will uh, object to it. Like, this will not let it go the other direction. Which means... If at all it moves, it will only move in one direction. And if it moves in one direction, you get some work done. It can be a pulley, for example. You can, you can in, pull water uh, from a well because it is going only in one direction. So, you know, you know the pull, how the pulley works, right? Because if it moves in one direction, then uh, the thread will go in that direction and therefore something you can lift it up. So, even if you lift uh, a nanogram object, for example, Forget about a bucket of work. Even then, you are doing work out of nothing. From thermal energy, you are getting a work done. And that will violate the first law of thermodynamics because you need to spend energy to get work done. It's, that's why I say, right? Thermodynamics is nothing is free lunch. So you need to work for your lunch. Even if somebody treats you with lunch today, be aware that you will have to repay back at some point. Okay. In general, if 
otherwise you no know, it's a great friend then probably can and um, you know uh, sponsor that lunch but not for long i can tell you that okay so free lunch is not there now so perpetual motion machine of first kind is the one that violates first law of thermodynamics if you search in the internet perpetual motion machine you will get a huge number of examples including books that will tell you that how many such de designs were actually submitted for patent so many people want it even if you videos are there also that you know getting free work not possible now there is another type of perpetual motion machine perpetual motion machine means that will the machine that runs perpetually without any input now perpetual motion machine of second kind are the ones which will violate second law of thermodynamics now this is only one perpetual motion machine that was patented patented meaning like uh, the patent authority will uh, agree that uh, yes this might work okay so it was the only one as far as i know by john gamgee who patented it because that time they you know they try to convince the authority that you know you use this machine you know it will run forever you will not need to spend any energy or any you know money on that and you can if you create an engine you can do lot of things with that now any motor or anything that you can create which will run just out of nothing you can get a lot of work done so here the idea was like this ammonia liquid will be there in liquid ammonia so sunlight will heat what will happen it will vaporize it will go to the other side and it will push the it will it will it will push the piston here and while pushing the piston it will do some work and become liquid and come here come here and uh, it will go back to the previous state so you are getting a cycle but in the in the, in the meantime you are you are being able to push it from this position of the piston to this position of the piston so you are getting some work done looks plausible right it's because you know it's something you know a cyclic process is going on you are using sunlight of course so energy is being spent so it's not violation of first law but but that although it is there is no violation of first law but there is a violation of second law because you are not releasing any energy you are getting full work done whatever energy is getting in is getting fully converted because there is no release of energy anywhere and that will violate second law of thermodynamics so this is a an example of perpetual motion machine of second kind you can read about john gamgee uh, his life was not uh, ended did not end very well i don't want to talk about that but again you can uh, you know this is a resource that you can take a look at now i'll come to very uh, extremely you know basic topic called thermodynamic systems and variables because i realized that many of us uh, have problems with that itself what is a system and what is a surrounding now let's talk about that what is a system and what is a surrounding if i take a bottle of water and consider that bottle of water only it will be a system a bottle of water will be the system and everything else will be surrounding what will be the boundary and the 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 wall of the bottle will be the boundary or, or the cap of the bottle will be the boundary but let's say if i take a half bottle water and i want to consider my system as only the water then that will be my system and the vapor on the top will be my surrounding which means that it will be an open system where the particle can vaporize from liquid and go to the vapor phase and from vapor phase come to the liquid so system and surrounding is your choice you decide what is a system and what is a surrounding so thermodynamic system is a part of the universe real universe that is under consideration for calculation of thermodynamic property you want to calculate the thermodynamics on the whole bottle take the whole bottle as a system if you want to consider only half bottle or only the water part of it and not the vapor part of it then that is your system you decide your system for your own calculation surrounding is rest of the universe physical universe that's how i understand of course uh, 
but again in all practical sense is the is a whole universe so just to emphasize this is the early picture of the universe whole universe and i put the bottle here it is of course not to the scale as you can see so many galaxies are there so you know billions and billions of galaxies are there so uh, and then you know number of stars so forget about it so they are you know one bottle so not to the scale but bottle plus the universe is our universe of course about you know system bottle the rest of the thing is uh, the surrounding is the universe okay so type of the system as i already said isolated system where nothing it's no exchange with the surrounding is allowed so I, I, if i take for example this thermoflux then that's an isolated system because you know it is not fully isolated because uh, if you put hot water it gets colder after some time right but imagine you have you know high quality very sophisticated military grade thermoflux even then it will be but let's say imagine then that will be an isolated system because you are not allowing the energy exchange with the surrounding if you put hot water in a thermoflux and and touch it you will feel cold you will feel the room temperature or rather it will slightly cold because of that uh, metal why because inside heat is not coming out and 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 and, and of course uh, matter which means let's say put tea tea is also not coming out you are not spilling that so both the matter and the energy are not exchanged with the surrounding in that case it will be an isolated system now closed system see we get uh, often confused with closed and isolated so closed is that's why i i take the example of this bottle closed is literally closed an open bottle and a closed bottle so so if i if i put a cap on this bottle it's closed but it's a plastic bottle so it allows energy exchange with the surrounding so if you put it in refrigerator the water will become cold if you put it in the fridge it will become ice only if you put it in a warm weather under the sun the water will become hot correct so although water will not escape but energy exchange is going on all the time so it's a closed system closed system allows the energy exchange but not the matter and then talk about an open system an open bottle of water now open bottle of water why it is open because not only that it can get cold in a fridge or hot in the, under the sun and all that you will realize if you keep this bottle no, on, uh, for a long time you will realize that you are getting you know the water level will decrease slowly you will you going to lose water from that bottle why because they are getting vaporized so you know it can go to the vapor and go anywhere in the universe or in the at least our atmosphere so what is going to happen is that that water molecule will get much more entropic advantage by going to the vapor so it will escape especially in a dry uh, weather of course in a moist weather if you have a lot of humidity and all then you know uh, that may not be that efficient dry weather especially for example in pune if you put a bowl of uh, water in a small bowl of water it get dry you know for example when you put uh, wet clothes outside it gets dry because vaporizes so it, it loves that entropic advantage to be in the vapor than to be bound to the clothes so that's why it goes out thermodynamics even while drying the clothes outside is playing a role and open system because both the matter and the energy exchange are allowed uh, the conserved quantities are chemical potential volume and temperature here closed system conserved quantities are or, or rather uh, thermodynamic variables so i didn't talk about thermodynamic variables i talked about systems right what are the variables thermodynamic thermodynamics are basically thermodynamics is a subject of macroscopic system okay so uh, we need uh, we need macroscopic variables to describe it for example you go to a shop and say that give me a 1 liter water bottle uh, in room temperature so what are the things you are specifying you are specifying 1 liter uh, water which means you are specifying volume you are also specifying 
temperature. You say room temperature. Okay. And pressure anyway is specified. Because pressure is atmospheric pressure. Otherwise, you will say, give me pressurized water. You know, if it is available, right? So, basically, you are specifying these three thermodynamic variables. And that will determine the state of the system. That shopkeeper will know what to give you. If you tell me, give me 250 liter water bottle. You are specifying, actually you are specifying N. N means number of moles. So one liter will have 55.5 moles and 250 will be of course one fourth of that. So you are specifying N, you are specifying P and you are specifying uh, T or NVT. Either NPT or NVT because the other one will be automatically calculated, calculable from the these three variables. So, so this is how you describe a system in macroscopic cases. So that's why they are called thermodynamic variables. So you vary in, you get a new system, double the water. You vary V or P or temperature, you get a new system. You put it in the refrigerator, it will be a new system. So, but these are only few variables that you need. And thermodynamics is a subject of equilibrium, which means that only when you know, it equilibrates and come to a kind of a rest, but not full rest, but it's called dynamic equilibrium, molecular level. Then only we can use these three variables to talk about it. So just like, you know, like coordinates. See, for example, nowadays, if you tell somebody that, okay, I, I know your friend calls, you said, okay, where are you? You will say, okay, I'm in the library. Then he, he will ask you that, where is the library? So you said library is between this and this. So you will specify certain variables to locate your uh, place. Similarly, these are the variables or these are the parameters that are required to specify the system. They are called thermodynamic variables. Once you specify, the system is fully specified. N, V and T for closed system. N, V and E for isolated system because energy is fixed. So it is not going to change. N is not going to change. And V is also not going to change. But for open system, your N is changing. Your E is also changing. Because E is changing, temperature becomes fixed. Because N is changing, chemical potential becomes fixed. Again, this we will understand later probably. Now, microscopic versus macroscopic variables. So all that I talked about just now are microscope, macroscopic variables. They ask for one liter of water, right? I already told about it. What is microscopic variables? Microscopic variables is position and momenta of all positions and moment of all the atoms or particles of the system. Now, if you have one liter, you have 55.5 mole of water molecule. Multiply that by Avogadro number, which is 6.023 into 10 to the power 23. Okay. Now, every water molecule will have three atoms. Multiply by three. And then, you will have their x, y, and z positions. And you will have that three momenta, px, py, and pz. All those variables are required microscopically to specify the system. But you can specify for both equilibrium and non-equilibrium cases. All the cases you can specify. But you need to specify almost like 10 to the 25 in the order of that many variables in order to describe the system microscopically. So you see, macroscopic and microscopic, there is a huge, huge difference. Same macroscopic variable, N, V, and T, one bottle of water will have so many possible values of microscopic variables. For example, in one liter of water, uh, one water molecule can be on the top and the another one will be in the bottom, for example, if you mark them. But same bottle, after some time, whatever was in the bottom will can come to the top and top can go to the bottom. Top water molecule can go to the bottom and bottom water molecule can come up to the top. It will not change the macroscopic variable, but it will change the microscopic variable. So therefore, there are so many possible microscopic uh, you know, uh, you know, variables are fixed, but so many possible values of those microscopic variables are possible. And that will give rise to you know, so many, uh, so many uh, differences. And of course, it will relate to that. Yes, Aishiriya, you have a question? Okay. Uh, the hands are coming up and going away, so I, I'm not sure. If you have questions, uh, you can ask. 
Okay, now extensive and intensive variables. What are extensive variables? Extensive variables that change with the size of the system. For example, volume. If you say one liter, uh, one bottle of one liter, uh, another bottle of one liter, if you make them you know, together, join them, it will become two liter. So it's an extensive variable. Number of moles. As an extensive variable, one mole and one mole will make it two moles. Entropy is also. But intensive variables are those which do not change with the system size. So you, you have one liter water in room temperature, you have another one liter water in room temperature, you mix them, it will become two liter water. What will be the temperature? Room temperature. Temperature is not going to change. So intensive variables do not change with the system size. Examples are temperature, pressure, and chemical potentials. And you will see that they are the ratios of two extensive variables. And that's why those cancel each other. And will give you an intensive variable. Okay. Equilibrium, very important thing. Thermodynamics is a subject, as I said, of equilibrium properties only. For non equilibrium, there is a non equilibrium thermodynamics. We are talking about only equilibrium properties. So let's say you take a water bottle, shake it. That time we are not going to discuss thermodynamics. We said, okay, let it settle. Once it gets settled, it reaches equilibrium. And what is equilibrium, by the way? I think I talked about that. A system is in equilibrium where there is no visible change in the system during the course of observation. For example, if I see a building, you know, is it in equilibrium or not? Yes, it is in equilibrium for an observation time of months or year or even hundred year. But in the in the scale of thousand year, do you think the building is in equilibrium? The building may collapse within that. So if I look at a span of thousand years, I will see a building got formed and broken. Both. It's not in equilibrium. So your course of observation is very important because that will tell you in that course of observation whether it's in equilibrium or not. So if you take a bottle of water, yeah, when you're looking at it for one minute, two minutes, it's in equilibrium. But if you do it for days and months, it may not. It may what water may evaporate somewhere, go somewhere. You will see a change. So that is very, very important. Uh, again, you can also define that what properties you want not to change for the system to be in equilibrium. You know, your NVD, for example. So, although my macroscopic variables don't change during the course of observation, microscopic changes always occur. That I already mentioned, water molecule going from the top to the bottom, bottom to the top. Right? I'll, I'll also show the example. So, and this, this also I mentioned, one liter bottle of water room temperature will mean so many variables. I already talked about that. This is just a beautiful pictures of water molecules. If you don't know the representation, the red color is oxygen and uh, these white colors are the hydrogens. And it's just a nice picture. It is not, it's not a representative picture of a real system. It's just a nice picture. Okay. So if there are n molecules, one has to specify six n variables in order to describe the properties uh, in a microscopic mac microscopic level okay so now uh, i think uh, 45 minutes gone so now i'm going to talk about zero block thermodynamics so if you have any question please uh, you know let me know and if you uh, you know uh, need a break or something like that uh, i don't know how to uh, really go about it so yes uh, prachi you can ask have any uh, hello, sir. Uh, okay. Like I have posted the question in the chat box over there, uh, but I'll again repeat it. Yeah, because I will... I'm in the chat box, it is better to ask me directly. Yes, sir. So uh, the question was: Can a body or a material or an object um, can we consider a body to be in equilibrium for an infinite time? Like when we, as you mentioned, that the course of observation is very important. So. Right. Um, can we say that or generalize the statement as there is a body? Can can there be any material object or body which can be in equilibrium for an infinite time? Nothing is in equilibrium for infinite time, right? Everything changes, yeah, right? Everything changes. Our whole universe changes. So nothing is in equilibrium, you know, if your course of observation is infinite time. Right, sir. Thank you. Any other question? So, so uh, I just wanted to know, uh, you know, if the poll can be conducted that whether up to this part things are clear or not. Like, you know, uh, although I have talked on uh, very, very basic stuff, but if there is any question, 
uh, in conceptual level because in this itself i have mentioned so many things uh, that might uh, give rise to questions so uh, jaman if what was yes. the last poll conducted uh, jaman yes sir yes. uh, last poll what was the statistics of uh, students from bsc msc because it's almost 50% 50% percentage. 50% bsc 50% msc yes and nobody is like below a bsc right no 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 oh, okay fine fine so no then i can really understand where to uh, pitch the thing, right so okay so uh, you know normally i ask this question in the class how many of you understand zero clock thermodynamics because this is not an easy law to understand in my opinion it is it and the, the profound uh, Uh, effect of zero law why it has to be put in the zeroth place first place actually it comes before first that's that is what is important you will see uh, you know normally i uh, you know i unfold the story slowly but i'll tell you i'll i'll, I'll break the thing first itself in case if you want to directly get into the answer is that it defines the temperature so without temperature we cannot talk about heat because heat is nothing but specific heat which is a constant quantity for a material multiplied by the temperature difference if we don't talk about heat we cannot talk about entropy because entropy is nothing but heat by temperature so you see without temperature neither the first law will exist nor the second law not the third law so the definition of temperature is the most important and fundamental thing in thermodynamics and that's how that's how it has come in the zero place now my second question what is temperature what what is this thing called temperature you know many of you will say that okay temperature is something that you know we feel we feel whether it's hot or cold can any of you speak up and say what do you understand by temp uh, by temperature any of you What is the decrease in energy? Sorry, tell me what's more. Increase or decrease in energy of the molecule. Okay. Okay. Uh, but that we cannot really define, right? Because it's kind of an undefined thing, isn't it? Like, uh, yes, it is increase and decrease. That is absolutely correct. But, uh, but in order to uh, the way we feel temperature, for example, we we feel temperature, right? We uh we we know what temperature is in our 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 mind how do you describe that it's a measure of hotness Me measure of hotness or coldness now hotness or coldness like when i touch a cup in a, a tea cup hot tea cup i feel hot if i touch an ice i will feel cold correct now this feeling why i am getting this feeling is it because of the inherent quantity called temperature or is it because there is a difference in temperature between that object and my hand and somehow our brain senses that difference oh, difference in temperature that difference somehow our brain senses right we feel it cold we feel it hot it is our brain that interprets it that way it is not a universal way one can say that this is what because you know i may feel that uh, cup hot somebody else may not feel that that much hot see sometimes what happens you know uh, when we cook something we we need to take the thing uh, from one place to another place and some people need a, a a cloth or something to cover it and some people do it by hand so the sense uh, whether it is hot or cold differs from person to person so that cannot be an universal measure of temperature so although temperature is associated with hotness and coldness it's associated with it is not hotness and coldness because hotness and coldness is basically a relative quantity it is relative to a personal uh, biases or feelings as i said just now that you know one can feel hot or one can see you know right now let's say you know if you are in pune you might feel the weather cold and if you go to west bengal it will be hot and uh, and if you stay there for a longer time then you might feel that okay weather is okay not that hot it gets adjusted with that 
So it is our brain that interprets that, right? But in thermodynamics, when you define something, we have to define it such a way that it cannot be changed. So keep that in mind that we need an universal measure of temperature. And how do we get that? Yes, absolutely, you guys are right. Hot teacup, cold this thing, and normal one. This is how we sense it. You know, there are uh, there are uh, anim uh, no, animals which will probably live in a very cold weather. They will not feel it is cold. Like you know, polar bear, for example, polar bear will you know will not feel it cold. Or uh, or uh, penguins, but they, they they will feel it very hot when you know. Uh, much more, they cannot even sustain in a, in a tropical weather. And we know a lot of trees that are grown in tropical weather and not in cold weather. So the point is that we, we all understand what temperature is, but how to quantify it? That is the question. Okay. And you will realize that this quantification of this comes from material property. It is not from the feeling of hot or cold, but from the effect of the energy, somebody mentioned that energy, you no know, increase and decreasing, that energy changing the material property. Okay, so this part I'm just skipping. Now we'll talk about this. So, okay, so here. So, what is the basic definition first? That if an object C is in equilibrium with A, and also it is in equilibrium with B, thermal equilibrium, and A and B are not connected with each other, then also, A and B have the same thermal, the A and B are in thermal equilibrium. So, if a property, any property P is same between C and A and same between C and B, that property is same between A and B also. And that property is temperature. So, now coming back to the statement again. If the temperature of C and A is same, temperature of C and B is same, then temperature of A and B will also be same. Now, it might seem obvious to you right now because we all the time see that. That if I measure temperature of a normal person, it will let's say come in 98.4 or 98.6. Temperature of other person, normal person, no fever, 98.6 Fahrenheit. And there is a thermal equilibrium between those two people, although they are not in contact with each other. And that, if that is the case, then only it will be universally true that that object, uh, that, uh, that, that property will, will be always same irrespective of what the state is, what the position is, where the person is, what or where the object is and all that. Which means that if I know that temperature of an object is 100 degree, it will, irrespective of what the object is, it will be 100 degree only. It will not depend on a, a boiling water will be 100 degrees centigrade, maybe in a, an iron which is heated to 100 degrees centigrade also will have the same temperature. So, irrespective of material, irrespective of the state, whether it's a gas or liquid or solid, that temperature, that quantity, which we call as temperature, will remain the same. And that property gives us the sense of hotness and coldness. So, hotness and coldness is an after effect. Measurement of the temperature based on the material property is the basic one. And this theory or law that tells you that even though A and B are not in contact with each other, if with A with C and B with C are in equilibrium, then A and B also will be in equilibrium, even though they are not in contact. Because then only it will be ensured that that property will remain same, irrespective of where they are. Think about it a little bit more, and you will see the profound uh, you know, nature of this statement. Now, we see if you think C as a thermometer, makes life simpler. Okay, C is a thermometer. C, you measure the temperature of A, measure the temperature of B, they are same, which means A and B will not transfer energy between them. 
simple. But that is the law that we are stating. And that, see, law comes first. And then we see whether the law is valid or not. If it is valid, we accept the law. That's how it goes in science. We, we postulate, we give a postulate first. Like Newton's equation of motion is a postulate. It is not derived from anything. And then we see that it is working. We accept it. Call it Newton's laws of motion. Thermodynamics, we give a zeroth law, postulate. We test it, is working or not. If it is, we accept it. That's how every theory will develop. It will be hypothesized first, tested then, proven to be right, and again proven to be right, keeps on proving right, we accept it. And when it will be, it will break, we'll find a new hypothesis. Science will evolve, our understanding will change. It is, that's why it's an evolving process all the time. It doesn't mean that it was incorrect. It's just that it is it evolves with time. Anyway, now coming back uh, to this one. So, the A and B will have no conduction of heat. Yes, that's what I meant, right? At thermal equilibrium, all matters possess a specific value of a quantity. That's what I'm saying. At thermal equilibrium, every matter will have a specific value. For example, A and B are in thermal equilibrium, although they were not in contact with each other, and they will... They will, they will must, they will must have one specific value of, of quantity that is temperature. So they must have same temperature. That's how we define it. We say that it is temperature. For example, now, now you can make it, make it a little bit more tangible. C is a block of ice. C is a boiling water. Now I keep A on top of block of ice. Then I keep B on the block of ice. Once they are A and B are in equilibrium with the block of ice, then A and B are also in equilibrium with each other. And both A, all A, B and C has now got the same property, which is temperature for all A, B and C. So if this is correct, because this is a law, if this is correct, then what you can do with that? We can define temperature. If this is correct. How we define the temperature? We use material properties. So we know that irrespective of the system, uh, you know, state of the system or irrespective of the nature of the system, it will be in thermal equilibrium. So we take a solid and put it on a block of ice. We measure its length. It will shrink. Or uh, it will it will have some value, okay. And then we place uh, on a boiling water. It will have some value. Now remember, note down the value. So 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 now anything that is uh, anything that is in equilibrium with the block of ice, if I put this solid in contact with that object, this solid will have the same length. Again, I'm repeating. Instead of block of ice. If I put this solid onto any other object that is already in thermal equilibrium with the ice, this solid will have the same length. Why? Because this solid is in thermal equilibrium with the block of ice. Also, it is in thermal equilibrium, therefore, with the other object, and therefore, it will attain a property. Here it is length. So, we are now using length to define temperature. Understand? We are temperature is intangible at this moment. We'll describe more tangibly. Temperature is hotness and coolness is intangible, but length is a measurable quantity. So we measure the length at block of ice, boiling water, and see their difference. Now material expands. Most of the material expands with with temperature, right? So it will be longer, and we know how much longer. Now, if, let's say, if I put this solid on something which is intermediate, not fully boiling, let's say, heated water, it will have the intermediate value of the length. And we know, we know that this third quantity has that property less or temperature less than that of a boiling water and more than that of an ice. How do we know? Not by touching it, not by feeling it, looking at the material property, looking at the length of the solid. 
So that means we are now defining temperature based on the zero law of thermodynamics that when things are in contact with each other, they will come in thermal equilibrium. Based on that, we now use material property like length will come to volume also to define the temperature. For example, solid will expand and contract very less because you know and measurements may, may be very very difficult because you know a small expansion will happen in a you know one degree centigrade let's see if I change there will not be many, much change in the property right so people understood that liquid is a better choice okay so, thermometer for example where you have mercury but then you know you know when you heat it up it will volume will expand right but then you know you take a very narrow capillary so capillary surface area, it's a cylindrical object, so surface area is fixed. So you can just see the length. So volume is what? Pi r square h. So pi r square is fixed. So you just look at the height and then you will decide that, okay, based on this height, now I will know whether it is hot or cold. Not by touching, but by using the thermometer. So which means if I put that on a block of ice, it will have some value. If I put that on a boiling water, it will have some value and then I will mark it. I will mark that as 0 degree centigrade. I will mark this uh, boiling one as 100 degree centigrade and I will divide all of them in between in 100 different parts and call it 1 degree centigrade. Will that be alright? Can any of you tell me? Will that be alright? Can I do that? Like, you know, put 0 degree, uh, you know, I, I see the expansion, I see the height at 0 degree, I see the height at 100 degree, and then divide into 100 parts. And each, you know, expansion by a little, little amount would be 1 degree centigrade. Is it okay? Any, any of you? Hello? Can you repeat the question, sir? Yeah, so my question is, I take a thermometer, okay? And, uh, you know, I explained that when I put it in, uh, in the cold, uh, like ice, then it will show some height, as you can see from my pointer, okay? And when I put it in a boiling water, it will also show some height. Right? Yes, sir. So we know that, uh, we, we now define that, okay, boiling water is 100 degrees centigrade. We define, we say that it is 100, value is 100. And we define this one as zero. Ice, okay, zero degree centigrade. Now, now I can now this change in the height. I can break it into hundred parts, and each part will be one degree centigrade. Yes. Sir. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So Anjali says yes. So anybody else? I mean, it looks okay, but is there a problem in this approach? That is the question. Now, it looks okay. There are two problems. One problem again is that, you know, your gradation one degree will be very, very small. That is fine. You can do that probably if you make it thinner. But main problem is that, you know, it has to guarantee that the expansion by one degree will be equal for all the way from zero to hundred, which means that the expansion of the liquid between uh, zero degree and five degree has to be similar between five degree and 10 degree has to be similar between 10 degree and 15 degree, then only I can make it equal grading. But there is no guarantee that can happen. So expansion coefficient, like del V by del T, which is expansion coefficient, will all, may depend on also the temperature. If it does not, then it will work. If it does, then there will be a problem. So liquid also, this kind of problems will happen. Second problem will happen is that where you are measuring. You know, uh, yeah, so that, yeah, that might be also, also a problem, whether you are uh, measuring uh, in the in a, in a sea level or in the, on the top of a mountain and stuff like that, okay? But ideally, this is possible and you got the idea that we need to define material property on two objects by putting them with thermal equilibrium with those objects and we define some value of temperature for those two and then we can get the, you know, all the intermediate values. Now, people soon understood that, you know, leave solid and liquid, go to gases, because they are easy to expand, 
the changes are huge and one can really get uh, the differences for a small change in temperature. So what they did is that they, they saw that when they plot pressure and volume against temperature, it gives a straight line, especially if the pressure is low. That means ideal kind of situation. Pressure is low means there are very less number of molecules, right? And they took different gases also because, for example, liquid, if you take mercury versus if you take water versus the methanol, the things will be different. But here, when they when they took all different types of gases, they saw that all of them, when they're extrapolated, it goes to zero at a certain same value. That was very interesting. First, and another thing is that it was kind of giving a linear behavior. Okay, so three important things, linear behavior, which means there is no, the, the gradation is all equal. That means zero to one degree, one to two degree, two to three degree will be same amount of increase. Uh, once you know the amount of increase and it all goes to zero. So that means whatever gas you take, as long as they are dilute, it will go to zero at certain value. And that value was denoted as minus 273.15 degree centigrade or zero Kelvin. That is given as zero. So PV equal to zero at T equal to zero Kelvin. That's it. One point of the line. And to draw a line, you need two points. So one point is you know, obtained. It's a straight line. That is an observation. That PV with with this hotness coldness will be a straight line that is proven that is already seen from experiment second thing is seen is that extrapolation gives us a zero at a particular value i define that as uh, t equal to zero and this is a gas thermometer for example i define that equal to zero and then what i do is that i see that the pv v bar is just one mole so pv is proportional to temperature why because with, with uh, PV, with temperature is increasing and it is linearly increasing. So proportional to temperature. Linearly increasing means it is proportional to temperature, not temperature square or Q or anything. It is temperature. Now we need the coefficient, you know, um, um, it is proportional, but we need the uh, proportionality constant. How do we get that? We need another point for that. So another point has to be very, very specific which can never change at all. So people have taken the triple point of water. Triple point of water is very specific. You need very specific pressure, very specific temperature. Uh, you know, uh, then only, you know, you get the triple. So they calculate the PV at the triple point. And the value of that is given to be 273.16, not 15, but 16. Okay? So 273.16 is the value given to the triple point temperature. So PV, whatever value you get at the triple point, which I denote by PV triple point. Now that will be 273.16, PV equal to zero at zero Kelvin. So if you now divide equally, you will get the change in PV for one Kelvin. That's how you get one Kelvin. And this happens to be, this happens to be R. This is an universal gas. Why is it universal? Because I told you that for all of the gases, as long as they are dilute, they were having the same line. No, like, no. Uh, they were having, uh, in going to the same zero value, right? So, this one, once you divide by 273.16, that same amount you get R. Now, R, we know, of course, we know what the value is. And, uh, of course, we know that once we get the R, we get PV equal to RT. PV bar equal to RT. V bar is VYN. So PV equal to RT and thereby we get PV equal to NRT. So PV equal to RT, we got it. What is that? Sorry. Yeah, here, here it's a PV, PV bar equal to RT, so PV equal to NRT. So you see, it's an experimental observation. The equation of state of an ideal gas is an experimental observation. And it helps us to define the temperature. Now, Boyle's law, we all of us know that PV is a constant, and then Charles law, all of us know Avogadro now principle, and all these things we know. So I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm going to show you a demo. 
So these demos are uh, many of the demos that I'm going to show demonstrations, demo short form, uh, is uh, from something called PHET FET Colorado. They have a beautiful list of many, many animations done there for a better understanding of the subject. So I'll show you one of them. Okay. I think at, at least it will be a, also a break from a monologue. So this is the, uh, you can see Fred Colorado, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Gases intro. So you, you can also play with it. You can go to Fred Colorado. If I just show you PHET Colorado. Go to Fred Colorado. I hope you can see my screen big enough to see that. So this is the site, PHET Colorado TDU. And you can get lots of simulations and animations here, physics, chemistry, mass, and for every subject. If I click on chemistry, you will see uh, you know, acid base, atomic interactions, so many other things. I will show some of them, okay? This is really, really beautiful. Now, let's go back. Now, this is the demo. Okay, so this is a box. And you see what are the things you can do. I can pump in molecules. Okay. I have a temperature 300 Kelvin fixed. This is not in equilibrium yet. Soon it will come to equilibrium. You will see that. Uh, you can see at, uh, pressure is 8.1 atmosphere. And you know, microscopically how pressure is calculated is by collisions of the particles with the wall. So there is a collision counter here which will measure on an average in 10 picosecond how many collisions are there. So let's measure it and you will see that there are on an average 57 collisions. But again, this is a statistical number. So number will be close to 57 at every instant when I calculate it. So let's do that once more. Should be very close to 57. Oh, 45. So that means it was not equilibrated. Okay. Let's try once more. 40, uh, 47. So I got 45, 47. Let's do it once more. 44. 45, 47, 44. You see, you are going to see a pattern and you will see an average value. And that, that average value is going is an indication of what we are now 45, 44 again. So when I talk about statistical uh, aspects, you will see that all that one measures in the statistical aspects of thermodynamics is the average value. So on an average, how many collisions are happening will give rise to an indication of the pressure of the system. And of course, uh, also you know, temperature is related to pressure and all that. Temperature has, again, uh, I will talk about that in a few slides. Okay, so what are the things you can do? You can increase the volume and you can see the pressure will decrease. Increase the volume further. You can see pressure will decrease further. You can um, uh, make the box open and there will be some particle can be released. That will drop the pressure and temperature both of the system. I can uh, pull it back. I can heat the system and it will increase the temperature as you can see. I can uh, cool the system which will decrease the temperature and I can have a mixture of particles. I can pump in some smaller, lighter particle, for example, and there will be a mixture of two particles. And then I can calculate what happens. So definitely the collisions will now increase. Let's see. Yeah, 59. Although remember, I, I increased the box of the volume, so that would have decreased the pressure. Okay. So, so these demos are uh, interesting to see. In fact, uh, in fact, you can do this. You can increase the pressure very high. Let's see what happens. Uh, increase the temperature very high so that the pressure also will increase, temperature also will increase. Let's see what happens. In fact, I did not do that, but uh, somebody did that and uh, and I realized that, oh, no, that is not happening here. It's just keep on, pressure is keep on increasing, that's it. Temperature is also keep on increasing. And you can see the collisions are, you know, becoming very faster. Yeah, 
Yeah. Now what happens? Burst. Breaks apart the box. Okay. So this is a nice demo of the gases. Of course, uh, again for uh, you know very very uh, small kicks, uh, it will be very interesting to see. And some of the conceptual parts also will be helpful. Now I will go back to my lecture slides here. So, so after increasing yeah. the temperature, yeah. the number of collision must have been increased, uh, right? Right, right, right. Definitely, it has increased. It has increased. So uh, I will show that once more at that time. You can see. Yes, uh, with the temperature, what happens? Because the pressure has increased, right? So if you keep the pressure constant and somehow increase the temperature uh, by by increasing the volume, then the collisions will not increase. So, uh, so the temp temperature uh, has something to do with your uh, the speed or velocity, and pressure has to do with the collisions. So if you increase the volume and increase the temperature such that pressure remains constant, you will see the number of collisions is remaining constant. Okay. Okay, so this is a summary of zeroth law. Now we know the property, we call it temperature. Uh, when the uh, two objects A and C are in thermal equilibrium, we know that that property is called temperature and they will be equal. And B and C in thermal equilibrium, so this temperature will be equal and therefore T TA will be TB. So now it is easy for us to know because we have defined all that. How to calculate that, you know, what to get out of that and all that. Okay, so zeroth law is now done. Now, it's a good time to talk about microscopic definition of temperature. Because we talked about macroscopic definition. What was the definition? That definition was that I need to associate a property like PV, pressure into volume, on a, uh, on, you know, in, in thermal equilibrium with an object for which we define the temperature to be something and we see the value. That's how we define the temperature for classical system. But what actually is happening? You saw the gas demo. When you increase the temperature, the particles are moving very, very fast. Now, that, that, that means, does, that, does it have some connection with, with the speed and the temperature? In fact, it does. So, here again, it is uh, another simulation, the same type, where you can see that particles are moving. And, okay, so I think... Uh, before talking about the temperature, we, I have started discussing about the pressure only. So let's say uh, this: uh, there are molecules which are moving in a box, and uh, I can calculate the momentum or change in momentum with time by using del del t of p. So p is the momentum, which is mv. So del del t of mv, um, uh, mass into velocity gives you momentum, right? And you know that is force because m dv dt m a force. So change in momentum is a force, is force that we know already, right? Now, let's say the particles are moving here, uh, as I showed you earlier. And now what will happen? The particles will go with collide with the wall here and will come back. Now, time taken for hitting the wall. So if the length is 2L, length is 2L, sorry, length is L, then after hitting, how much time it will take to hit it hit back? It will go to the left wall and come back again. So 2L distance is need to cover and its velocity is V. So 2L by V is the time that will be taken by the particle to get hit again. So time taken for hitting the wall two consecutive times will be 2L by V. Now rate of change in momentum is, and what is the change in momentum? So you are hitting with MV and you are getting back with minus mv, so change in 2mv. mv minus of minus mv is 2mv. So 2mv by time, which is 2l by v, will give you mv squared by l, which is force. So what is force then? mv squared by l. Force is mv squared by l. And what is pressure? We know. Force per unit area is pressure. So force per unit area is mv squared by l by a. And a is nothing but, I have taken a cubic box. So l is nothing but, a is nothing but L square. So M V square by V. Now you see P V equal to M V square. But we know that there are N molecules. And out of N molecules, the probability of hitting one side of the wall is one third. So P V is basically will be for N molecules, it will be N by 3 M V square. And we know that P V equal to M K B T. 
Therefore, when you combine both of them, what do we get? N by 3 NP square equal to N K B T. And therefore, what do we get? N N cancels each other. What do we get? K B T is 1 by 3 NP square for, of course, three dimension. So, so NP square is kinetic energy, right? All of us know. And K B is a constant. N is a constant. We have taken a constant number of particles. So temperature is nothing but kinetic, you know, average kinetic energy. So this description that I talked about is an on an average, right? On an average, how much time it is taking? That's why I showed by the collisions. So m v square is nothing but uh, kinetic energy. So temperature is nothing but average kinetic energy of a particle. So some you know, when I rub my hand, you no, know, my hand gets heated up. That means temperature is increasing. That means the hand particles are, are, are vibrating with higher velocity. That's how the temperature is increasing. When I drop an object, see the cannonball experiment where cannonball was dropped from a tower and when they fall down, they get heated up. Why? Because the kinetic energy uh, the, the potential energy of the ball got converted into the kinetic energy uh, of the ball and that kinetic energy got into the vibrational energy of the particles of the ball once it comes to the rest and that's why it gets heated up. So, to, so, so uh, I, I hope this is clear, right? So, temperature is average kinetic energy. For example, our body a hand, whatever, will have, or, or let's say some object like my mobile phone will have all the particles here together on an average having a kinetic energy that will correspond to the temperature of this mobile. So if I put it in a, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a boiling water, then what will happen is the kinetic energy of each and every particle will try to increase not each and every particle together they will try to increase and come how and that will give rise to melting of this object probably because it will be so high that it will go apart from each other so the solid will melt into liquid because the kinetic energy becomes higher so water mark of molecules will have higher kinetic energy than the molecules of the ice similarly steam will have uh, steam particles, water, part water molecules in the steam will have higher kinetic energy compared to that in water. So average kinetic energy increases. So average kinetic energy is nothing but temperature from the microscopic point of view. That gives rise to all that. And we know that when you talk about temperature of an object, doesn't mean that all the particles will have the same velocity or same speed. But for a specific temperature, like the one I'm showing here, for a specific temperature, there will be a distribution of velocities. Some will have higher velocity, some will have lower velocity, majority will have this velocity. So, so what will happen that all of them will not have same velocity. But at a, at a particular given temperature, the distribution of velocities will be Maxwell Boltzmann like. And again, you know why that happens? To maximize the entropy. Again, I will not go into the detail of that. This is the equation, uh, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution equation that is here. And I have, I think, a demo here to show you also. Okay. So you can see n by 3 n v square is n kvt. So v will, I uh, you know, average velocity will have, uh, will, will be proportional to. Um, t to the power half and uh, inversely proportional to mass. So if you increase the mass, your average velocity will decrease. Increase the temperature, average velocity will increase. Now this one, this one is also good. Another demo, same gas demo, but it will give you the energy distribution, I guess. I think this one. Yeah. So I put in some... Uh, Gas particles here, temperature is fixed, and you see the distribution of speed is shown here. So initially, it was not Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. So that means they were not in equilibrium. 
So again, to identify what is equilibrium and what is not in equilibrium, you have you need to look at the maxwell Boltzmann velocity distribution. So when, for example, we perform simulations and all, you know, our systems, we need to know when it is coming to equilibrium. And that is one of the way to find out that at, 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 at normal, you know, at, at, at a fixed temperature, uh, volume and uh, number of particle condition, which is closed system condition, the velocities or speed, speed uh, distribution of speed of the particles, you need to be Maxwell Boltzmann. Now you see, it's not that perfectly Maxwell Boltzmann because the number of particles is not enough. So let's make it a little bit more. Now, Yeah. Okay, so here is the kinetic energy distribution, here is the speed distribution showing. Okay, so now let us do one thing. Let us increase the temperature and see what happens. Okay. Oh no, uh, decrease the temperature. Let's decrease the temperature and see what happens. Now, right now, 300, right? Make it colder. So, all of you know, right, what should happen? The distribution should shift to left hand side. It should be picked more and more to the left hand side. But still there will be particles with higher velocity. I will leave it now, 42 Kelvin. So distribution is shift to the left. But there will be particles with higher velocity, but majority of them will have an intermediate low velocity. Low speed, I am saying velocity, but it's speed basically. So yeah, so that's, that's about it. Uh, if you have smaller particles, um, if I inject something more here, you can see that uh, we'll have uh, definitely that will have uh, it, it's inversely proportional to mass, right? So assuming that the mass is less for the smaller particle, it will it should shift to the right. But the temperature is same, so velocity should be a little bit higher, correct? So velocity or speed should be on the side. You can see that red one is on the right hand side. I should increase the heat now just so that we can compare it better. And number of particles, more or less, I will try to make it same. So this is uh, 160, make it 200, no, 200 something, yeah. 200, 200, all right, same number now. And you can see uh, they are the same temperature, and I should increase the temperature. 300 is a good choice, okay. Let's increase faster. Okay. Yeah. So this is enough. And you can clearly see, it's, you know, same temperature, but because lighter particle has like lighter means less mass, you clearly have a different distribution compared to the heavier part. And also it shows some average speed. As you can see, lighter particles are moving with higher speed than the heavier particle. Although they are at the same temperature. In fact, there are a lot of research problems uh, how uh, how uh, heavy and light particles will have a diffusion, what kind of properties will come, what will happen when you cool it down too much, and all, all sorts of interesting stuff people can actually look into. Okay, so you guys can actually uh, uh, do some, you know, uh, playing around yourself with this, uh, sim, you know, animations. Uh, it will be both fun and also probably you'll understand something more clearly, which was not that clear before. Okay, so with that, I'll go back to my presentation. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, after adding the smaller particle, uh, Shouldn't be the energy should decrease uh, decrease uh, because is there uh, there can be a collision between the molecules and the energy will decrease uh, kinetic energy will decrease after the collision if I'm not wrong means okay so so, so the thing is uh, what happens is that first of all I think these particles are ideal gas particles that are taken uh, in which you have no energy okay so these particles are ideal particles. Uh, 
ideal gas particles have no potential energy. That is first thing. Uh, and collisions give them, uh, okay, so if they're ideal, then collision will not happen. So the, you can say they are kind of a hard sphere kind of particle where there is no interaction as long as they are not hitting. And if they heat, so what will happen when they heat with some kinetic energy, they will have an opposite uh, kinetic energy. The reduction that you are saying because of attraction, that may be there, but remember, I have fixed my temperature. So if I have fixed my temperature, then if there is an interaction there, even then they have to increase the velocity. So Anjali, so I'll, I'll clarify myself once more. As long as your temperature is fixed, no matter what kind of interactions are there or not there, you will have the same maxwell Boltzmann velocity distribution. Okay. Remember half m squared equal to half kVT. That's it. So that's why even, you know, you are right that maybe there, there will be an interaction, therefore they will come close together and they will need more energy to escape. Correct? But the temperature, because it's a closed system, right, that energy will be supplied. It will be supplied to the system. So if because of interaction, they slow down and then temperature will fall, but we need a constant temperature. So there is a path associated with that that will supply that energy and it will regain its uh, velocity. Okay, so as long as temperature is fixed, velocities, average velocity will not drop for a given mass. Uh, I hope that is clear. So now we'll go back and uh, that is this is done. Okay, so now another demo, very interesting, that is the diffusion demo. Okay. But why I am talking about diffusion right now? Mm, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe we'll talk about that later, diffusion. Not now, okay. Maybe at a later time. Okay, so now, again, moving on with the temperature, that thicker. So now we know that solid length or gas volume, by that we measure temperature. Also, we have understood that we measure temperature by um, kinetic energy. But again, kinetic energy we cannot really measure, right? If you give me a bottle of water, I don't know what is the kinetic energy of each and every water molecule. It's impossible. So, therefore, that option is not there. Now, hotness and coldness op option is, of course, there, but we also have a thermometer option, which is liquid thermometer. I can put it in the this thing and I can measure it. But can any of you tell me that how do I measure temperature of a lava, for example, or that of a sun? How do I measure temperature of this object? Shall I bring a thermometer there? Or shall I take a gas thermometer there? Or what are the other options? Kinetic energy, no, impossible. Nobody is going to measure that. So how do I measure temperature of this object then? What is the definition of temperature does not change, by the way. What is the definition of temperature? Average kinetic energy. That does not change. But how do we measure temperature? How do we define and measure? That changes because whether what kind of thermometer we use. Whether we use a gas thermometer, a solid thermometer, or, or you know, uh, liquid thermometer, that will tell us based on the material property that what temperature that object has. Now, how do we measure for the lava? Any of you, please? How do we measure this? Don't hesitate. Very important. So, if I have to measure temperature of sun, of course, it's impossible to bring a thermometer there. Right? So, we have other ways to do that. And one of the ways to do that is called black body radiation. I, I know that, you, uh, I hope that you have heard about it. So, an object, when it radiates energy, uh, you can calculate the intensity of that radiation versus the frequency and it will follow this kind of a curve. Just like Maxwell-Boltzmann kind of a curve, it will follow this kind of an equation. This is called black body radiation equation. Now, based on the black body radiation equation, you will know that what is the temperature of the object. Okay, so I want to show you that, but uh, the link is not here. So let me go to Fed Colorado and uh, let me search black body. 
Yes, I got it. Black body spectra. If I downloaded that, it would have been faster, but it's okay. It will be quick. Yeah. Now you see, so this is this red curve is the black body spectrum. And this uh, rainbow is showing you that what is the visible range. Now, this is the temperature. Now you see temperature of the sun. Temperature of the sun is around uh, 5800 Kelvin. And the, you know, the color that we see is a combination of all these colors of different intensities. Okay. Now, imagine what is going to happen if temperature increases. It is going to shift to the left hand side. So it becomes more and more blue. How do I decrease this? Okay. Yeah. You see, it is going to be become more and more bluish. So the stars, which has like 10,000 Kelvin and all, will be more blue and violet. Violet, we have very less number of cells in our this thing to the eye to detect violet, but we see as blue. So it will be blue star. We'll have like 10,000 Kelvin and all. Now let's go to a lower value and see what happens. What will be the temperature of that lava, which was red? So we'll go down. And you see we are in the red region. And the temperature is 4200. But again, you know, but it's a combination of all the colors, right? So is this. You have to match the black body spectrum, actually, in order to really know the temperature. Yeah. So you see around 3,000 and all. So anyway, if you match the black body spectrum, you will see that it is the, the temperature will be around 1,100 Kelvin. And I have shown that, I think, in my slide, uh, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000. Huh. So yellow is like 4,000, right? The lava was somewhat yellow and somewhat uh, red. So it will be like 2,000 to 4,000, I think, yes. So you see, I will go to 4,000, 4,000, and you see this, this is the part, red part, majority, and also I have some amount of yellow and some amount of, uh, some amount of uh, green and all that is there, okay? So this is how we will know the temperature of a particular object from the black body spectrum. Now, human being also radiate. But which range they radiate? Our temperature is 300 Kelvin, right? Uh, body temperature. So let's go to body temperature. Uh, 300, a little bit more than 300, 310 and all, right? Uh, assuming 37 Kelvin degrees centigrade. So 37, oh, the lowest I can go is 200 Kelvin. Earlier I could go to 37. Two hundred Kelvin. So I'm, I'm making a mistake. So thirty-seven plus two seventy-three. How much it is? Three hundred ten. Correct. So I go to three hundred and ten. Approximately three hundred. Now where has it gone? I have no idea. So let's uh, let's see here. No, it is not showing up here. Earlier I could do that. Anyway, so so the point is that you will see that this will peak in the you know infrared regime. So so we we actually emit infrared light, which is lower than infrared is uh, frequency lower than red, and therefore there is this camera, that heat sensor camera, that detects the infrared radiation. And that's how one can see. So again, you will you know, know the body temperature also. This, this, uh, this infrared guns are there nowadays. People uh, are using to check the body temperature. Remember, uh, for corona nowadays, you know, nobody is using thermometer, right? So people are using all those guns. So they actually uh, have, you know, check the infrared radiation from the body. And thereby, they get the sense of temperature. Okay, so I think I think that that's where I would like to end today for 40 and you know 
I think I'm using my energy now. So we will continue tomorrow. But I'm here to answer any of you know, if you have any questions. So I think almost, Jaman, uh, almost two hours, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Almost. So yeah, so now I'm you know, losing energy. So I will, uh, if there is any question, I will stop here. I will continue from different forms of energy tomorrow. Uh, and I would like to know that whether the pace was slower, faster, or okay, so that I can continue accordingly tomorrow also. If the pace is slower, then I can increase my pace tomorrow. And uh, secondly, also uh, I want to know whether the topic or topics were you know, which were discussed were too simple or too difficult or okay again because uh, accordingly I can change. Because unless I meet you guys, um, it will be not possible for me to know exactly. Uh, sorry, there is some background noise. Yeah. So, uh, so depending on uh, depending on that, I need to uh, know that where exactly I need to teach and which part needs to be discussed. So, uh, if some things uh, some things are trivial for you, then I request that you should uh, tell me that so that I can skip them quickly skip over those points quickly and get into the uh, other things. So you are, you are muted. Yes. So you are just muted. Okay, now, now it's okay. Yeah, yes. So uh, you could hear me till when then? Yeah, just a few seconds. Sir. Few seconds. Okay, got automatically muted. Okay, fine. So yeah, so um, I will just stop presenting so that. So again, so my point is that uh, please give all those feedback so that uh, I can continue accordingly for the next few days. Again, remember this is uh, basic thermodynamics, and therefore. Uh, I'm trying to cover the basic stuff and a uh, lot of other things which I cannot cover will be available in NPTEL. And if you have any questions, that will also help me to know uh, how much you understand and how much uh, I need to cover. Okay, so with that, I will stop and Jaman, I will yeah. work with you. Sir, we have, also, we have also shared a Google form so that the students can actually ask questions and we will share it with you. That is that is great, and yeah. I can answer those questions. And in this Google form, make it anonymous so that they don't have to specify their names. Yes, yes. Because sometimes they hesitate to yeah. uh, see their name. So, but, so please make use of that opportunity also, so that any fundamental sir is actually explaining everything from the very fundamentals which you don't get in uh, at least from directly when you read your textbooks. That's are available. So please make use of it. Even you can. Uh, fill those Google forms because sir is with us for a uh, couple of days more. So please make use of it. Yeah. I think the pace was good and the basics were very elaboratively explained. Sir. So I think this should be okay. And that's what we see in the chat box also. They mm -hmm. say, students say the pace is okay. Okay, so pace is okay. Excuse then. me, sir. Yeah, yes. Sir, can I have a question? Sure, sure. Sir, uh, you have said that absolute zero temperature is hypothetical, right? Yes. So, can we generate such a condition in labor laboratory or such like or any no, things no, like that? So, thermodynamics. I will when I will discuss about entropy, then you will see that uh, that reaching absolute zero is uh, prohibited by second law of thermodynamics. So, you cannot reach absolute zero because if you reach absolute zero, then it will violate second law of thermodynamics because uh, then your efficiency of engine can be one and many other things. Okay, but you can go very close to zero. And I think for both Einstein condensation and all, they could reach up to nano Kelvin, which is 10 to the power minus 9 Kelvin, as you know, close to zero as probably possible. I don't know even I don't know the, the lowest value one could go, but but I know that people could go up to um, milli Kelvin, micro Kelvin, and nano Kelvin. It's very difficult, but people can go up to that, but not zero. Okay, sir. Thank you. Students, are there any more questions, please? Sir, can I have your two minutes, uh, please? Uh, not about the topic. Yeah, can yeah. I ask? Yeah. 
so I, I have done my graduation, I have done my BSc, and now I am pursuing for my MSc. But uh, my problem is I am not clear with the basics. So should I uh, take one year gap and then do, or uh, should I do, or uh, should I continue? Uh, so uh, where you are facing uh, difficulty? So as my concepts are not very much clear. Okay. So uh, I'm uh, finding very much difficulties during the lecture show. So uh, sometimes I g literally get frustrated because I don't know this, I don't know this. I have talked to my teachers, but they told me taking gap is not worth. But I think so. Uh, going without uh, knowing the concept is like going in the wall without uh, sharpening our weapons. <laughs> right, right. I know. I understand that. So, but the problem is that, you know, what happens that if you leave this and take a gap, there is no guarantee that you will be using that time to study those things. You, you know, they, it is easy to get diverted. So, I think in my opinion, you know, you try as much as possible to bridge those gaps till the exam time and maybe uh, if it is possible to delay uh, the exam or give in the next year, at that point you can decide. But uh, don't leave it now because even classes uh, are going to be helpful. Try to discuss with uh, students of the class uh, and also uh, take help of uh, online lectures. Yeah. You know, whatever topic you are having doubt, right? Search that topic in Google from authentic sources like from either Khan Academy or from um, MIT lectures or NPTEL. And if you, if you find that, just look at that part okay so that is one way we can you can uh, clarify your con conceptual problems secondly do the assignments whatever assignments is given to you by teachers in the class if you do them even if you cannot uh, let's say do yourself uh, look at the solution that they provide and then do it okay so these two things if you do i i'm I, i'm sure that a lot of the gap will be covered Yes, sir. thank you so much. Sir. And you never know that, uh, you know, how you compare with rest of the, you know, India, right? So you are only looking at your surroundings, few people who are in your class and few people who are sitting with you and talking to you. But actual reality, will, you will come to know only when you will go out, give interviews and evaluate yourself. Okay. So don't try to judge yourself before that. That is, that is what I, my suggestion would be because often people think that okay, I'm not good enough. But actually when they go and they see that they are doing well, then they get the confidence. Okay. So both overvaluing or overestimating oneself and underestimating oneself, both are bad. Yes. Okay. Okay. Then. Any other? Thank you, sir, for your valuable time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yes, sir, can, uh, sir uh, the PPTs uh, which were discussed today, can it be shared with um, us so that we can revise it uh, before the next lecture? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think it's possible. I will, uh, if I, I can send it to uh, Professor Jaman Matthew and maybe he can share with, uh, or shall I say, send a link directly so that that link can be shared. I can keep it in a Dropbox and uh, share the link. Okay, yes, sir. sir. That will be very helpful. Okay, I will do that. I will do that in next one hour. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, uh, Manavendra, since you asked me the question, so this topic, so you are studying BSc or MSc? Uh, sir, I am pursuing a third year BSc in chemistry Okay. from Xavier's Ahmedabad. And did you study uh, thermodynamics in your, you know, you know, in your college? Yes, sir. Uh, it was included in semester one syllabus okay. of physical chemistry. Now, now, the, now, whatever I covered, it, did you know all the topics of that or there was something new in that? Or there was, everything was basically uh, revised? Yes, sir, uh, the few uh, topics uh, in the starting presentations were already taught, but the the simulation part, I got to know about it, it was very fascinating that uh, uh, this thing is also there in which we can simulate because according to me, uh, if we feel the practically, we uh, see the things uh, rather than theoretically, 
it is better uh, to understand things yeah, and I that po- like, uh, even uh, now after 2 hours of lecture i have not started my past law thermodynamics okay yes yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, normally people start with the past law right so i yes. have not i could not even come to past law after even after 2 hours which i will probably hopefully will come in the next uh, next lecture yes uh, sir the concept of temperature how uh, we can visu- uh, how we can um, uh, say it in an another way the things are so much um, basics and the roots uh, are important for every subject so it was an amazing right. for so, that so that is the objective of this because see, you can you know you, you can find all these things in books but they are not in a in, in a one particular place or your uh, when you read books you will not think about what happens to other thing see for example you look at thermometer you will not think about other kind of thermometer so maybe all of you can come tomorrow and let me know how many possible thermometers can be there you know how many thermometers types of thermometers you already know for example one is mercury thermometer you know i talked about gas thermometer then uh, nowadays you are using this uh, ir thermometer you know for kids people use some another thermometer in the ear to measure temperature so you tell me tomorrow how many temp- thermometers can be possible and what are their principles because all of them are not having these principles of expansion for example ir is not is using black body radiation or something is using expansion or material property so but everywhere there is this maxwell boltzmann velocity distribution is there microscopically that is governing the temperature that is yes. the beauty part of it but in that how the sound will travel how the radiation will happen those things are are different and that will come out to be so anyway so i will um, to think about that uh, and once you do that you will ask for a source to know that right so once the question comes to you then you will try to find out where should i get the answer and once that part you come to that part now you answer any way you will get so answer is not the bigger worry for us the bigger worry is the question because we don't even ask the question to get the answer na so if you ask today one particular question you will not remain unanswered somebody will answer you somebody will tell you the answer for that question but do you ask those questions to yourself that you should first see that's why i tell my students here that the smartness of a student is not in answering a question but in asking a question because that is the most difficult part and in science it is all about asking those questions the the scientists who ask the most relevant most uh, amazing question they get the most amazing research done okay even if somebody is very smart if that guy knows everything but cannot ask any question he will not get a nice work done right manavendra yes yes sir right so theek hai so think about that any okay, other question sure, sir okay students if there are no more questions we will wind up the session since it was an inaugural session i invite uh, miss vishnumaya for a formal vote of thanks and please come on time tomorrow so we will share the link so please be on time hello good evening one and all honorable chief guest eminent personalities faculty members and all the participants I feel immense pleasure to deliver a vote of thanks to this occasion. As part of national level student enrichment program for strengthening the chemistry fundamentals jointly organized by Chemical Research Society of India and St Joseph College Devagiri, we will have 50 hours live online section on different topics of chemistry. On the very first day, we have got a golden opportunity to have a section on the topic thermodynamics. I would like to express my immense gratitude to Dr. Arnab Mugaji, Professor of ISO Pune, who conducted this section. It was really an informative class. Although thermodynamics is a topic we have been learning from very small classes, this class really helps us understand it in a very easy manner, from the very basic level to its higher aspects. I extend my gratitude to the coordinators of this program, Dr. Jaman Matthews. 
Assistant Professor, Department of Chemistry, St. Joseph College, Devagiri, and Professor Mahesh Hariharan, sir, I serve Trivandrum to coordinate and organize such a useful program. Then I would like to express my hearty gratitude to the advisory committee members, our manager, Father Biju Joseph, sir, our principal, Dr. Sabuke Thomas, sir, Dr. Ta Tania Thomas, the head of our department, Dr. Manoj Matthew, sir, coordinator of DBT Star College program. All of you have been a constant source of support and inspiration on our path. I would like to thank all the audience of the program who participate overwhelmingly and make it sound success. Once again, I thank you all. Let me conclude my words. Wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you. So let us conclude the session. Thank you all. Hope see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Bye bye. Don't forget to fill in your uh, uh, questions if possible in the Google form. Please ask if you are not hesitant to ask questions directly. Please come up with your questions on the Google form that is shared in the WhatsApp. Thank you.